This is happening across the board. Uh, not only, you know, if you look at the, the miners relative to gold or miners in the copper space relative to copper prices or looking at energy companies relative to oil, all those things are becoming more and more resilient. And so when you see the riskier parts of the market behaving better than their actual commodity prices, usually it's a sign that you're in a bullish environment. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for January 8th through January 15th, 2024, while supplies last. First this week, we feature backdated one quarter ounce gold eagles at just $65 over melt. Next, the Armenian one ounce silver Noah's Ark coin is $3.49 over spot. And finally, we have a very limited quantity of one ounce silver Trump wanted bars at $3.15 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Tavi Costa from Crescat Capital. Tavi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Well, it's great to have you. Um, I did want to ask you first about the yield curve inversion. You've been doing a lot of analysis on this, um, but it seems like this year it could be uninverted if we're looking at the two and 10 year uh, treasury yields. Your perspective on that and the impact it may have on the economy. I think it's actually one of the most attractive ways to sort of play the recession idea is to bet on the steepening of the yield curve. And that would be uh, mostly, I think that the 10 year yield, the long end is likely to go much higher because we're entering the year with a lot of uh, estimates that inflation is going to continue to decelerate. In fact, is the reason why you see six cuts in the Fed uh, funds rate already priced in, in the market. And so I highly doubt that that's going to be uh, the case. Uh, and then you may be asking, why would you then buy the two year yield? Well, it's just a hedge. Uh, but I do think the steepening of the yield curve is going to be. Uh, in line with the recession, regardless if it is a stagflation or more of a, a deflationary shock. I, to ask me, my base case is definitely, I would put a 70% chance that it's going to be more stagflationary. Um, and as we see uh, things developing moving forward uh, in terms of the debt problem, you know, that we have a funding issue in the U.S. and uh, we're going to see a lot of issuances happening in, in 2024. And it's, it's difficult to believe here that we're not going to see upper pressure on 10-year yields moving forward, that it's going to cause the steepening of the yield curve. And think about this. I mean, the, we're now, if you look at the, the percentage of inversions in, in the U.S. Treasury curve right now is at about 80%. Um, you know, we usually have a, a threshold that when it goes above 70% is when we have a recession uh, unfolding and so forth. And this is the first time in history we've been through 15 months already where this measurement is above the 70% handle. So that's uh, uh, that's something to consider as well. When it comes to the U.S. national debt, we just topped $34 trillion. And you've mentioned how a lot of this debt is going to have to be reissued. More than $8 trillion soon will have to be reissued at higher interest rates. What are some of the concrete risks that people will face um, with this reissuance of debt and, and uh, you know, ballooning national debt as a whole? Yeah, it's a good question. It's going to be about $8.2 trillion that will have to be reissued in 2024. Um, you know, the big question is how much of that is going to be issued on the long end, given the fact that Janet Yellen has been mocked over uh, recently with uh, Druck Miller actually mocking her for not raising or for not issuing a lot of the debts on the long end. It is uh, difficult to believe that we're not going to see any decline in interest rates on the 10-year or 30-year yields, not going to cause her to actually issue a good mix of that $8.2 trillion on the long end. And if that happens, it's what creates the upper pressure on yields to rise, along with the idea of a potential reemergence of inflation. So to me, the 10-year yield looks uh, really attractive in terms of, uh, of, of, of the potential for that moving forward uh, much higher. Um, and if that's the case, you have to consider the fact that uh, interest rates and, and equity markets have been uh, have had a very strong correlation since the top of the market in 2021. Uh, and what changed that correlation, meaning when 10-year yields rose, we've had a decline in equity markets. 
What changed that was the chat GPT release and the AI craze certainly uh, added fuel to the speculation fire uh, in 2023. Um, and, and But now we're starting to see that correlation come back to normal, meaning uh, that every time 10-year yields rise, we're seeing upper pressure or downward pressure on equity markets to decline. And the main reason why we've had this recent rally in U.S. stocks has been mostly caused uh, by uh, the change in financial con conditions, mostly uh, driven by the declining interest rates. So if you are of the view that interest rates uh, are likely to rise much further on the long end, uh, and you think that we're going to see the steepening of the yield curve uh, to occur, then you are also of the view that equity markets are going to look pretty challenging in, in this year. Do you see it then kind of looking closer, uh, 2024 looking more like 2022 rather than 2023? Because obviously we had a rally in 2023. The stock market seems to be hitting all-time highs right now, and a lot of people are bullish, but it doesn't sound like you're bullish this year. Well, I, I think that's a trillion-dollar question, and you may also say that I have not been bullish for a very long time, and the main reason for that is because I think when markets get really expensive, you just want to ignore uh, the noise. I think that's completely noise. Why, you know, spend your capital buying a business that is trading at 50, 100 times earnings when you can buy other businesses for, you know, three to five times earnings in very established uh, places in the world, uh, such as emerging market companies that are trading at much more attractive valuations. And so to me, it's a much better proposition uh, than actually doing that. But it, it is a big question. I mean, is it you know, it, what happened in 2021, end of 2021, all the way to the end of 2022, to me, was the beginning of a new investment cycle uh, where, you know, you do want to be favoring value investing principles. You're going to be seeing investors rewarding profitability, given the fact the cost of capital is so high, forces most of the, the companies to be uh, to actually focus on profitability. And as we see that and as we see investors rewarding that, uh, we will see industries that have not actually performed very well to start becoming the new leaders of this uh, next cycle, which I believe would be mostly driven by commodity related businesses and so uh, and emerging markets in general. So those are the, the big and, and think about all the trends that happened in 2022 and extrapolate that moving forward if you're an investor. What, what are those trends? The collapse of the fixed income market was a big one. The second one was uh, all the, the reckoning moment we've had with money losing uh, bus uh, uh, businesses that we had, mostly in the technology space, with uh, uh, software companies actually suffering significantly during that period. Another one was safe haven currencies like the Japanese yen, uh, which was falling apart. Uh, we've had uh, emerging markets doing better than developed economies. We've had uh, even the value to growth or the growth to value transition happened in that year as well. So all those trends really, uh, with with uh, the exception of mega cap companies, all those trends have not been reversed. And I think they're going to become more and more pronounced uh, in the next five to 10 years. Now, when it comes to commodities, I know you're very bullish on commodities. You recently stated that we could see a commodity squeeze uh, this year. Can you expand on that? I think there's a lot of reasons for that. The risk reward for buying oil right now is really attractive, but oil is not the only thing. You look at metals and mining, they've been attempting to make a breakout for many, uh, for, for about two to three years. They've been consolidating after that COVID upward movement that we've had in gold and silver and other metals. Since then, we've been consolidating in most of the metals outside of gold. And I think that as gold breaks out, it's going to drive other metals to also have an incredible year. And so it's hard to believe that metals and mining industry won't uh, benefit tremendously from a re-rating of the price of those underlying commodity uh, prices overall. And the other thing would be oil itself. Oil, to me, is the risk reward is, is, is skewed to the upside in a large way and mostly driven seasonality. Seasonality plays a, a big role in energy prices. Positioning, we've had positioning across most commodities actually being very uh, bearish overall. Uh, and I'm referring to even ag agricultural commodities. But back to oil, uh, you can also look at uh, positioning in futures, look quite uh, uh, bearish in general, and that is usually a sign of the turn. Uh, and valuations of the overall sector, uh, the valuation for energy companies today is as attractive as it was at the death of the global financial crisis right now. And this is because the prices have declined 
but fundamentals continue to be very strong. I mean, there's a reason why Warren Buffett is, is buying energy companies. I think that's a, an attractive sector to be allocated towards. Um, another thing I would say is pay attention to uh, the, uh, the, the, the behavior of producers relative to actual prices of commodities. This is happening across the board. Uh, not only, you know, if you look at the, the miners relative to gold or miners in the copper space relative to copper prices or looking at energy companies relative to oil, all those things are becoming more and more resilient. And so when you see the riskier parts of the market behaving better than their actual commodity prices, usually it's a sign that you're in a bullish environment. So to me, this is just, uh, you know, adding, adding uh, further support to my thesis. Now, the Fed minutes recently came out. Your perspective on the Fed minutes, um, the Fed policy in 2024 and how it will impact the markets. I think the biggest surprise about the Fed, well, first of all, the pivoting of the Fed was key. Um, I think some people and myself were expecting that at some point, but how soon it happened certainly uh, somewhat shocked me because I wasn't expecting that quickly that they would be turning. Uh, nonetheless, who cares about what I think? I mean, in terms of the Fed minutes, itself is is what is important about that has been the shift from inflationary worries about uh, becoming more on the labor market and some of the sentences they use to express their views about if the labor markets do start seeing some weakness uh, which i suspect it will happen soon uh it will it will actually drive policy in a big way and that means that they're going to be acting towards uh, you know, uh, uh, further rate cuts or uh, or changes even in the balance sheet policy and so forth. And all those things are very important for uh, for for the commodity space, because I, I as I said before, I think inflation develops through waves. We've had a first wave uh, in 2021 uh, coming out of the covid recession. And I think that that's, you know, the genius is, is out of the bottle when it comes to the psychological impact in consumers and businesses. And I think that that's going to be continually pressuring uh, uh, consumer goods and services much higher in terms of prices. And especially the commodity space is going to be one place that will be a leading indicator of that. And so pay attention to times when uh, when you hear headlines like, you know, inflation decelerates and therefore gold is rising. I mean, that, that just makes zero sense because gold is, is, a, is, is a forward looking indicator for inflation. And you know, certainly is recently making new highs and so forth and, and having a very strong move in the last months or so uh, certainly uh, reflects the, the fact that we may see actually inflation reaccelerating soon. It is uh, encouraging uh, for the gold market. It seems like that we're seeing sustained levels above 2000. I know we saw that breakout uh, a few weeks ago above 2100. Um, but ever since then, it seems like we've really sustained that $2,000 level. Uh, your take on the recent price action. I love it. I mean, if you are a bullish uh, in, 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 in metals in general, that's what you want to see. You want a market that is not hot, uh, but it's it, but it's strong, and that's what we're seeing. It's not speculative. It's just uh, it's just it's strengthening with time, and you see volume improving, uh, and also the resilience of the miners in down days on the gold price, and that is very strong because the the big thesis to me is that the big pools of capital in the world economy are yet to allocate money towards gold, and those two are pension funds large uh, 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 retirement funds in general have zero allocation to gold today. Uh, you know, there was a good uh, uh, Bank of America uh, fund manager survey that came out recently in which, uh, you know, uh, over close to 90 percent of them have, uh, or I should say 99 percent of them have, uh, you know, uh, don't have over uh, 5 percent of their portfolio in gold. And so those things are certainly adding to uh, the pressure of uh, of potentially becoming a high demand for the metal. The other thing would be central banks overall. I mean, central banks have been buying gold for a while. Uh, we've seen the change in the last five years in terms of purchases. But more importantly, what we're seeing, uh, which I think it's very, uh, very good, is 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 the fact that when you look back in the 70s, uh, the purchases were close to 70 to 80 percent of their balance sheets, and now we're still at low below 20 percent of their balance sheets, and so. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics in terms of capital flows that can change towards uh, potential drivers for the gold price from the demand front. And the supply side remain very, 
uh, 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 in general, very uh, strict. I mean, look at the, the global production for gold has been declining since 2019 before the COVID recession. Uh, and that also coincided with, with, with other gold cycles like the 70s or, or even the early 2000s also had the production for gold declining. In your take on silver, I know the last time we had you on, you were saying that gold was setting up for a big run. We saw that um, and that silver would outperform. Um, is that still your view? If we see a further breakout in gold, that silver will be outperforming this year? Absolutely. I mean, it's just it's insane that we haven't seen silver lead the way yet. And also the miners, a lot of people are seeing that as as a problem. To me, I see that as an opportunity. So I've been looking for ways to accumulate more assets in the space. I wish I had another year to make more accumulations, but I don't think that's going to happen. I don't have any, any influence in the gold space, but uh, when it comes to influence in the price, but you know, to me, it's just uh, uh, incredibly attractive to see a market that it continues to become stronger and stronger from the demand and supply side. And people are just completely neglecting to uh, allocate capital in the space. And so, uh, silver remains sort of the, the sweet spot of not only a monetary metal inflationary asset, but really falls into even the green revolution uh, uh, aspect that is really attractive. And so uh, it is to me uh, uh, as close as it gets to a no brainer. And so I like to own a lot of silver and I also like to look for assets that have a lot of production of silver, which are very rare to find. Um, and miners to me are in the same place as you see that the, the the gold movement developing itself over time. It's hard to believe that the miners are not going to follow and not only follow, but lead to the upside as they usually do, particularly the, the riskier parts, like the, the explorers that tend to uh, make a lot of new billionaires in the industry every cycle. And so um, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, optimistic about that industry and, and I can't wait to, uh, um, to really uh, you know, make money in this overall space because I think there's a lot of ways of, of making generational wealth in this in, in this industry over the next decade. Just to kind of give our viewers a perspective on where the mining sector is right now, if you look at the GDX, back in 2011, the gold price was below where it is today. The, the peak in the gold price is, was below where the gold price is today, but GDX was about double, right, of where it is today. So, What's the significance of it? It seems like miners are extremely undervalued right now. Yeah, I, it, my feeling is that it probably has to do with the cost of building things and the cost of labor in general and the cost of even energy still, despite the fact that it has declined, it still is relatively high to, uh, compared to other periods in history. But it's important to know that mining, the mining industry is, or the mining space overall is a very, very challenging uh, a part of, of the market to invest. And, you know, there are most parts of the, 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 the century, the last century, it was a terrible place to be invested. But there are certain decades that you want to be focused on that. And those are the inflationary decades. And I think that the market is, is underestimating the fact that we might be entering a period like those, a long-term inflationary cycle, which doesn't mean we can't see inflation decelerating and accelerating at times just means that we may see overall during that decade, the annual inflation rate will be higher than prior decades and so, uh, or higher than historical standards. And as we see that happening, it tends to cause the value of hard assets to increase much faster than the cost to produce. And at some point, the cost to produce catch, catches up with that. And that's why you see uh, the cyclicality of this industry. But we're so far away from that. We haven't even seen the, the, the high uh, appreciation that we tend to see in hard assets overall. So, you know, we're, we're at very close uh, to see that in my view. And the other thing I would say, look at the M&A cycle that is starting to uh, to unfold in the space as well. We're seeing some of the major companies uh, uh, buy some other smaller businesses. Uh, and that is very encouraging because uh, that usually tends to trigger uh, the re-rating of valuations in, in, in the industry. And so we're starting to see some of that. And that's uh, that's very attractive for uh, especially institutional investors. And if our viewers are interested in learning more, they can go to crescat.net. I'll also put a link to your YouTube channel in the description. Um, it's very informative presentations you have there. Can you tell us a little bit about your work over on the YouTube channel and also crescat.net? Sure. You can follow my work on Twitter at Tabi Costa as well. 
The website offers a lot of the uh, uh, letters and, and research that we do in the space, not only mining, but really macro related. Uh, and Cresca runs three funds. I mean, we have a global macro loan short and a precious metals related fund. Uh, so we put our money where we think markets are going to be behaving in the next five to 10 years. And I think the best way to really make money is identifying big macro trends that will develop over the next five to 10 years and create a vehicle to make money on those things. And you know, we have a vision to invest in exploration and development phase stories. And we've been building a portfolio for the last three years uh, to really capitalize on that. So I believe strongly that will be one way uh, to really capitalize uh, in this uh, all these investment ideas. Fantastic. Tavi, thank you so much for your time today. Any last thoughts before we let you go? No, I appreciate the time. I think 2024 will be very different than 2023. I, I don't think it's going to be a, a, a continuation of the trends that we've had in 2023 in terms of the uh, the Magnificent Seven in particular driving the markets much higher. I think that leadership will change quite dramatically. And, it, the, you know, we may see other leaders, uh, maybe small caps are, are prone to do much better. Maybe emerging markets are going to drive markets uh, in, in a better way, but certainly it won't, uh, in my view, look like 2023. I think that was uh, that will be uh, much more like 2022, for instance, when we had a more challenging, more volatile a uh, year uh, overall. And I think that's much more likely than what we had in the prior year. All right. Well, Tavi, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thanks for having me. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And these are the Miles Franklin weekly specials for January 8th through January 15th, 2024, while supplies last. First this week, we feature backdated one quarter ounce gold eagles at just $65 over melt. Next, the Armenian one-ounce silver Noah's Ark coin is $3.49 over spot. And finally, we have a very limited quantity of one-ounce silver Trump wanted bars at $3.15 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.